On this Labor Day weekend, we turn our thoughts and attentions to what I'm calling this morning the saving life. The saving life is not a term that Paul uses in our text for today, but I think it's an apt description of exactly what Paul is talking about when he's writing to his Christian friends in Rome. He's describing the kind of life that we as Christians are given as a gift, but it's also the kind of life that we are encouraged to live. So it's a gift but it's also a challenge for us every day. I'm calling this life the saving life, and I invite you to hear how Paul describes it this morning as we read our text together. It's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8 this morning. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. You can follow along in your Bibles or in your order of worship for today. Paul, nearing the end of this letter to his Christian friends in Rome, writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, for then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For it is by the grace given to me that I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us has one body and many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word this morning. For many Christians, this passage in the book of Romans is a very familiar text for us. Maybe especially the first two verses of chapter 12 are familiar to us. Some scholars have even said that these verses are some of the greatest words Paul ever wrote. These words describe the importance of using our spiritual gifts, of living the life in grace that God has called us to live but this morning, I don't want us to focus just exclusively on the aspect of spiritual gifts. I want to pull the lens back just a little bit this morning and think in broader terms today. I'd like for you to think with me about what I said earlier, God's amazing mercy and unbelievable grace in our lives and how it enables us to live the life God has called us to live. You know, in many ways, when we think about God's grace, it's kind of like if we're looking at God's mercy and grace, it's kind of like looking at a kaleidoscope or maybe a prism. There are so many different aspects to it. And as we move it around and continue to look at it, we see and understand so many different parts of God's mercy and grace. That's true throughout Scripture. In the first 11 chapters of Paul's letter to his Christian friends in Rome, he talks about God's grace and he talks about the different ways we understand and see and experience God's grace. He goes through a history of God's grace in Romans. He says in these first 11 chapters, he talks about God's grace for Israel. He talks about God's grace through Jesus Christ. He talks about how God demonstrates grace to the sinner and to also those who are 
were righteous. He talks about God giving grace to the hopeless, to the helpless, even to those who don't know that they need God's grace. Paul even has God's statement to Moses quoted. It's from Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, where God says through Moses, I will have mercy and grace on whom I choose to have mercy and grace. And I will have compassion on whom I choose to have compassion. In all of these ways, Paul describes the grace of God and he talks about the opportunity that we as Christians are given to live what I'm calling this morning the saving life. The life that is filled with God's mercy and God's grace. This is our gift. It is our opportunity. It is our challenge. So Paul begins chapter 12 with an appeal and a curt encouragement. Paul's appeal is to live this life of faith that reflects the grace we have been given. So this morning I want you to think with me about what he says as he describes this kind of life that we are given the opportunity to live. And think with me about your own life, about how it reflects God's grace. When Paul describes this kind of life for us, first he says, I want you to understand this life, this saving life, is a life first and foremost that is offered to God. It is a life that we understand is a gift from God and therefore we offer our lives back to God. Remember what Paul says at the very beginning of this text. Offer your bodies, offer your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. You see, Paul is reminding us of this truth. If everything we are, and everything we have is a gift from God, then the most appropriate action we can take every day of our lives is to offer our lives back to God. If everything we have and everything we are is God's gift to us, the most appropriate thing we can do every single day is to offer our lives back to God. That's living the saving life. That is a life that is holy and pleasing to God. You know, often here at church, we sing that hymn that is entitled, Take My Life and Let It Be. That hymn perfectly describes what Paul is talking about at the beginning of Romans chapter 12. The words of that hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, were written by Francis Havergal. And This hymn was written after an overwhelming experience of mercy and grace in Francis' life. Following that experience of mercy and grace, these words were written. Listen to the words. Take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands. And let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. The words continue about offering this life to God. Take my voice, let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips, let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will, it should no longer be mine. Take my heart, it is thine. On thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord. I pour it at thy feet, thy treasure store. Take myself and I will be every, only, all for thee. What incredible words. As you're listening to those words, let me ask you, have you ever in your life made a list of all the things in your life that you could offer to God? Have you ever thought about doing that? Just taking a piece of paper and a pen or just taking your phone or a tablet or whatever and just making a list of all the things 
that you have that you could offer to God. Maybe sometime later today. Maybe Labor Day is the perfect time to do this. Is there part of your life that you have kept guarded from God that you could offer? Is there, are there some of your moments, some of your days that you need to give to God? Some of the things that your hands do, some of the places that your feet take you, some of the words that cross your lips, many of the things that happen in our activities and daily lives are these things we can offer to God. Maybe the money that flows through your bank account. Listen again to the words. Take my life, Lord. Let it be consecrated. That means dedicated to you. Paul says, offer your life as a living sacrifice to God. That is the saving life God wants us to live. But notice something else. This saving life is not only offered to God, but it is also formed and shaped by God. Once our lives have been offered to God as a living sacrifice, we then ask, well, what is it that determines the shape and the form of our lives? Can you evaluate the power of various influences in your life, family, friends, jobs, hobbies, activities? Where does church fit in? What are the primary formative influences on your life? What forms and shapes you? According to our text for today, for those who live the saving life that God wants us to live, the primary influence has to be God. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. Paul uses the word, the Greek word for world here is aeon. And that word literally means this age, this time in which we live and all of its influences. Paul is saying, don't let this age don't let this world, don't let the pressures and influences that are a part of our everyday life, don't let those things shape and form your life. Don't let them be the mold into which you put yourself. Don't let these things shape and form you. We all know the world we live in tries so hard, desperately, to shape and form us. We are surrounded every minute of every day by influences that seek to pressure us and they do the very best they can to form us, to influence us, to press us into shapes and sizes that conform to the patterns of this world. Media, advertisements, TV, the internet, music, political speech, on and on. I could go this morning all of them try to shape our lives. They do their very best to conform us to their intentions. But Paul is saying, if you want to live the life God has called you to live, the gift of the life of grace and mercy, then that life is not shaped and formed by this world. It is only shaped and formed by God's Holy Spirit. God is ready and willing to help us. See, we don't have to rely solely on ourselves to live this kind of life and to be shaped and formed. All we do is open ourselves up to allow God's Holy Spirit to form us and to shape us and to influence us into the kind of life God wants us to live. Let me ask you, how do you know what shapes and influences your life today? What are the pressures and influences that come to you? You see, this means that we can trust everything into God's hands. Everything in our lives. All of our fears, all of our worries, all of our concerns, all of the hardships we're currently going through, all the difficulties that we are challenged with on a daily basis. The Bible teaches us God is not just the creator of this world. God is the sustainer of all of our lives. 
We read it earlier in Colossians. Logan read it for us. Doyle shared it in his prayer. Jessica said it with the children. Remember that line in the text in Colossians, God is before all things and in God all things consist. That is so important. Throughout history, philosophers and theologians have said that God is like a cosmic watchmaker. God set the world into place and then set back and let it operate on its own terms. But that is not the God of the Bible. Since the very beginning of creation, God has been intimately involved with all the happenings of this world. God sustains and keeps us every moment of every day. See, let me share with you that when life brings you to those difficult moments, when life challenges us with hardships and difficulties that are too hard to comprehend and are overwhelming to us emotionally and spiritually, when we pray, Paul is reminding us that we are praying to the very creator of this universe, God, who created this world and holds every atom in place, is the sustainer of each one of our lives. God is, Paul is giving that to us as a word of hope and encouragement as we travel through the difficulties of our lives. That's what shapes and forms us as Christians. So because this saving life is offered to God and shaped and formed by God, then another very important thing Paul talks about here is that our lives are then oriented toward God. What does that mean, to orient our lives toward God? Well, it means to arrange. It means to position ourselves in such a way that we are ready to receive God's grace and to share it with others. Many of us spent time yesterday watching football. Um, hopefully your team's won. I won't get into that this morning, but... Um, if you watch football, then you know that those people, those players who are playing, they have to position themselves. They have to arrange themselves. They have to orient themselves. If they're a lineman, then maybe they have to get in a three-point or a four-point stance to be in the right position and orientation. If they're a back, they need to know the angles and the ways that they need to be facing in order to turn the right way. That's all orientation. If you watched the Olympics a few weeks ago, every athlete in the Olympics, regardless of what the event was, had to arrange and orient themselves for the event. If you're running a race, you get ready, you prepare, you get oriented. If you're a swimmer, you prepare yourself to dive in. Regardless of the activity, you have to be oriented and set up and arranged so that you are in the right position for what you're about to do. The same thing is true in our spiritual lives. Paul is asking us, how is your life oriented spiritually? How are you positioning yourself in order to live the life God wants you to live? See, Paul says, when our minds are on the things of this age, when we are oriented to this world then we are orienting ourselves for destruction. That means our focus becomes, and our time and our effort and energy are given to the things of this world. But Paul says when our minds are oriented toward God, when we position ourselves to allow God's Holy Spirit to live through us, then the good news is we are set up and oriented toward the life God wants us to live. It is positioning our lives in such a way that we are prepared to experience and live the life God wants us to live. Well, and all of that means the most important part of this is that the saving life then reflects the grace of God. That's where we started. This kind of life that God wants us to live, yes, it is shaped and oriented toward God. It is formed by God. It is sacrificed and offered to God. But in the end, the life you and I are called to live reflects the grace that God has given to us. 
when we position ourselves correctly, the grace of God that shines on us then is reflected to everyone we come in contact with. We live a life that reflects the grace of God in everything that we do. We are encouraged to live this life. And Paul says he does so, listen, quote, by the grace that is given to him. Toward the end of that exhortation, he points out, we all have gifts that differ according to the grace that God has given to us. So through our gifts, through our offering, through our sacrifice, God's grace is reflected to others. In the latter parts of Paul's letter in Rome, to the Romans, um, in 13, 14, 15, and 16 in those chapters, Paul goes on to describe what this life looks like. And he says that living this life is evidenced by humility and respect for others. This kind of life is evident when we are eager to serve others. God's grace is reflected in this kind of life when we make a difference in this world. I invite you to remember this morning, the Bible is full of stories of people whose lives were transformed by God's grace. And once their lives were transformed by that grace, their lives begin to reflect that grace to other people. Adam and Eve were restored to their relationship with God even after they sinned. Abraham and Sarah were blessed with the child after waiting years of infertility. Ruth was redeemed by God's grace and given an entirely new life. King David was forgiven for his horrible sin. Elijah was fed by ravens when he was by himself in the cave in his time of need. God provided for a widow who had no oil and in the end her Vases or jars of oil were overflowing. God ministered to Job in his time of pain and heartache. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were rescued from a fiery furnace. On and on we could go. The Bible is a story of God's grace transforming people's lives and then their lives reflecting that grace in everything they say and do. Today we see this saving life in the reflection of God's grace in people who are peacemakers in this world, not those who choose to create conflict. We see God's grace in the lives of people who overcome evil with good, not in the lives of those who stir up dissension and heartache and strife. We see this saving life of God's grace reflected in the lives of those who truly love and care for other people, especially those who, whose opinions are different from theirs, whose lifestyles are different from theirs, but they reflect God's grace and love to those who see and experience life differently in all of these ways. We see the grace of God reflected in lives who have been transformed by God's grace. And then through dedicated, faithful service, that grace is reflected to everyone around them. This morning, as we read these words, we ask ourselves, does my life reflect and show the grace of God? When others see me, when others look at me, do they see how I am transformed by the grace of God, not conformed to this world? When others look at me, do, are they attracted by God's grace that surrounds me and fills me? Are they repelled by the division and strife of the world in which we live? Paul says that it is time for each one of us to let go of the things of this world. It is time to let go of the worries and fears that consume us. It is time to let go of the division and strife that consumes our world today. It is time for us as Christians to let these things go and not conform to the ways of this world. But instead, Paul says, lay your life on God's altar and let God make the necessary alterations in your life so that you may live a saving life. Present your life 
as a living sacrifice, let God and his grace be reflected in all you say and do. Let us pray together. Good and gracious God, this morning we are most grateful to be reminded of the grace that you have given to each one of us. But this morning, Lord, we're also grateful for the appeal, the challenge to live our lives every day in such a way that it is clear to the world that we do not conform to the ways around us, but instead we are transformed by the Holy Spirit and the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Lord, lead us and guide us to be those people who live the saving life you have given to each one of us. For we make this our prayer in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.